Hello everyone, welcome back to Talking History. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you all keeping well. Apologies if you can hear the rain outside. I believe it's Storm and Kieran. He is well and truly making his mark. So I hope you're all keeping safe and dry and warm and just being well. But for today's video, we are back to the Plantagenists and today is all about King Richard I, the Lionheart. But before I get any further into the video, I do want to do a contents warning of anti-Semitic and there is mentions of suicide. So those things you can't quite listen to at the moment, I would completely understand if you want to click out. But please look after yourselves. That's the most important thing. But for you, if you are staying and you want to know all about Richard I, please do stay right where you are. <laughs> Richard was born on the 8th of September 1157 at Beaumont Palace in Oxford. Now Richard was the third son born to King Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine. Now being the third brother, Richard wasn't really expected to succeed to the throne. Richard, he had spent his childhood in England at least his first eight years and he received an education in manners, singing, dancing, languages, poetry, which became a favourite pastime for him, and he also composed his own poems in both French and Occitane, which was a French dialect mostly used in romances. Richard, he was said to have been tall, blue-grey eyed, with a uh, handsome, with reddish blonde hair, and his courage had been noted from a young age. Richard, he also enjoyed church music. When Richard was nine years old, he was betrothed to the eight-year-old Alice, daughter of King Louis VII of France. Now his father, Henry II, had promised Louis that his daughter would marry Richard when she came of age. Henry, though, he never fulfilled that promise. Instead, Alice was kept in Henry's court for 25 years. And during that time, Henry reportedly had took Alice as his mistress. Richard, now being older, would have received further education in military medieval warfare and mastery of the war horse. It would have been years in training and Richard excelled through all of them um, much more than anything else. And Richard, he was quickly proven to be a very gifted war warrior. Now, Richard also received a religious education and he grew into a religious man. He had always ensured he attended mass and he was always attended by bishops and priests. And later, Richard would financially support the church. In 1173, when Richard was 15, his older brother, Henry the Young King, rebelled against their father in what become known as the War Without Love. Richard and his brother Geoffrey joined the re rebellion along with their mother Eleanor, who was captured by Henry's men and as she was racing to get to her ex-husband's court. Richard, along with his brothers and King at King Louis's court, was knighted, and Louis he was keen to see the downfall of King Henry II. However, the rebellion force had failed to oust Henry, thanks to his military and political skills. Henry, though, he forgave his sons and Richard and his brothers were pardoned. Their mother, though, was imprisoned until the death of her husband, Henry. And when Richard came to the throne, he finally had his mother released. 
Richard was Prince of England. He held the titles of Duke of Aquitaine and Count of Poitou, and his reputation as a gifted field, com field commander was growing. In May 1179, when Richard was 21, he led his army into the siege of Taliborg, which was thought to be impregnable. Although Richard was only 21, he was already a veteran at warfare. He was an expert. When at Taliborg, Richard had the siege engines put in place and from that moment, it took Richard only three days to take Taliborg. His victory had led to the other counts and lords who were still holding out, surrendered their castles to Richard. And Richard didn't just sit back barking orders, he was at the front fighting in the thick of things. In 1182, Richard's older brother, Henry the Young King, once again rebelled against their father. And in doing so, this time Henry had tried to raise a revolt with the Lords of Aquitaine against Richard's wall. Henry had hired mercenaries to attack and rob churches and shrines throughout Aquitaine. Richard, who was now highly experienced in warfare, quickly acted first against his enemies. Richard, he hunted down the enemy forces and executed all who he had captured. After two days of intense riding, he came across a mercenary force who was being led by a rebel count who was robbing a church near La Marche. The mercenary force, they had no idea that Richard was coming and the rebel count had managed to escape. Now Richard's horses were far too exhausted to pursue the count. So Richard and his men captured many of the mercenaries and he had some drowned in the river. Some were put to the sword and others he had blinded. As for Richard's rebellious older brother, Henry the Young King, fate intervened. He fell ill and died of dysentery in 1183. Richard was now the oldest surviving son. He was heir to the throne. But all was not over with the family squabbles. Old King Henry wanted to make his youngest son, John, Duke of Aquitaine, leaving Richard Henry. But Richard had been at war in Aquitaine for eight years, making the duchy his own. And Richard, he loved Aquitaine more than anything. And he was willing to risk everything to not give it up. Geoffrey, although he was Count of Brittany through his marriage to Constance, he wasn't happy at being left out. So he teamed up with his new best friend, the King of France, young Philip II, to invade Anjou. But once again, fate intervened. Geoffrey had died during a jousting accident in August 1186. King Philip then began whispering in Richard's ear that maybe his father might give the throne to his favourite son, John, and disinherit Richard completely when Richard visited Philip in Paris in 1187. Richard and Philip had spent a lot of time together. They ate off the same plates. They even shared the same bed, and it's from that especially in the 20th century, that the idea came that Richard was a homosexual and he and Philip were in fact lovers. But that was a purely of a misunderstanding of the past. It was quite common for men to share the same bed. Even Richard's brother, Henry the Young King, had shared the same bed with William Marshall as a sign of friendship and peace. Richard and Philip were simply using each other. They publicly showed signs of unity to politically threaten old King Henry and it worked. Peace talks were held and terms were agreed. 
On the 3rd of July, 1187, Jerusalem was captured by Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt and Syria, this becoming the Third Crusade. In the autumn of 1187, Richard had took the cross at Tours. Richard was the first prince to announce that he was going on crusade. Although Richard was acting out without seeking his father's permission, but King Henry II and Philip II also took the cross. Those who didn't take the cross were given gifts of a spindle and wool, suggesting that they were women only suitable for staying home and spinning. The financial pressure was high. Everyone had to pay a tax to fund the crusade. Only those who took the cross didn't have to pay. King Henry II, he had taken the cross and he had promised to go on crusade, but he never did. Henry believed he had far more important things to do. But as for Richard, he was fully committed. Those who had taken up the cross were keen to get going at once, but it wasn't as easy as that. They needed to raise a huge amount of money. It also required planning and preparation and the local wars continued. Rebellious counts attacked Richard's lands and in return Richard attacked their lands. And then in 1189, Richard fell out with his father once again over his inheritance. And once again, Richard sided with King Philip. They attacked Henry's forces, but by now, Henry was far too ill and weak and he was driven into flight. It was here where a famous incident occurred. Henry's rear guard was under the command of the famous medieval knight, William Marshall. Now Richard and his men were behind Marshall's men when suddenly William Marshall turned his horse and rode straight at Richard Marshall. He leveled his lance and aimed it directly at Richard. Now according to Marshall, Richard cried, by God's legs, do not kill me, Marshal. That would be wrong, for I am unarmed. William Marshall replied, no, let the devil kill you, for I won't. Now, apparently, by God's legs was one of Richard's favourite things to say. William Marshall, he lowered his lance and killed Richard's horse instead. Old King Henry, weakened, went to the safety of Sheenon Castle. There, King Henry II of England died on the 6th of July, 1189. Richard, he walked into the Abbey Church where his father's body had been taken. And there he stood. He said nothing. He showed no signs of emotion and he simply turned away. Richard was now 31 years old. He had been at war since the age of 15 and he was now King of England. Richard was crowned King on the 3rd of September at Westminster Abbey and Richard's coronation was the first coronation where a detailed account still exists. Reports from the ceremony stated that there was bad omens noticed during the coronation. A bat had fluttered around Richard's head during the coronation and the abbey bells began to ring mysteriously. At Richard's coronation, Richard was preceded at the aisle by his greatest barons. William Marshall carried the scepter of gold, Robert of Leicester the gold spurs and his little brother John walked among them. Richard swore to protect the church to exercise justice and to get rid of bad customs. Richard was then stripped to the waist and anointed with holy oil by Baldwin Archbishop of Canterbury on his head and chest. Richard, he then picked up his crown and handed it to the archbishop. The tradition later came for the archbishop to pick up the crown. 
after the coronation came the celebrations feasts and this is the warning content for the anti-Semitic and suicide. So after the coronation came the celebration feasts and whilst they ate, London burned. Some of the Jewish residents had bought gifts to give to Richard and sadly this wasn't likened by the Christian onlookers and they attacked the Jewish people. Some were wounded and some were killed. The mob then went further into London looking for more trouble. London had sparked a wave of anti-Jewish violence. At King's Lynn, Norwich, Lincoln and Stamford around that time, the Jewish population had been around 5,000. The violence then escalated into the worst period of English history. In March 1190, a fire started in York and in the confusion, the Christian citizens attacked the Jewish communities. The Jews fled to Clifford's Tower for safety. And unfortunately, the warden wasn't trusted by the Jews and they feared that he would have been bribed by the Christian mob and they refused him entry and sadly the fear and mistrust led to an even greater tragedy. The warden he complained to the sheriff and by doing so only raised the mob more who were now prepared to storm the castle Meanwhile, inside the castle, a fire had been started. In fear of being forced to renounce their faith, had made the decision of suicide. The men took the lives of their wives and children before killing themselves. A few Jews that remained had begged for mercy. They were promised mercy if they were to renounce their faith, only for them to be betrayed the moment they stepped out of the gates. They were all killed. The Jewish community of York, of around 150 Jews, were massacred. The leader of the Christian mob had that led the crowd onto the cathedral where all the Jewish documents were burned and the terrible event had caused York to be cursed for 800 years. The curse would not be lifted until 1990. Richard had the rioters in London arrested and three of them were hung. He encouraged a terrified Jewish man to recant and return to Judaism. Richard then sent letters to every shire ordering for the Jewish community to be left in peace. The ringleader in York had fled, was forced to flee to Scotland after Richard had him pursued. The attack on the Jews was a personal attack on the king. The Jews had the official protection of the king. The Jewish community and all of their properties were the kings. However, that protection ended with King Edward I. Now, I know that is wasn't very nice to listen to and it's the worst part of history. And it's one of those things, I love history, but I also hate it at the same time. But it's important to be remembered and I hope you're all okay. I hope you enjoyed the video. Like I said, this is part one. I will be back soon with part two, maybe part three, depends how much, how, how long I want to spread it out for. But I hope you're all okay and I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope, I hope you can take something away with you today. And like I said, keep safe from Storm Kieran and um, please do subscribe and like and share so we can reach more and more history lovers like yourselves. Uh, in the meantime, look after yourselves, take care and I'll see you all soon. Take care.